Well, hello, and welcome to Algebra for Everyone, Conceptual Strength Through Discovery. My name is Josh Britton. I'm the founder and CEO of Get More Math and a 20-year math teaching veteran. We'll start with a story that I think kind of gets towards the main point of this session. The first time I taught a class called Intermediate Algebra, we began with review. And I still remember this very excited student who said, oh, 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 I know how to do these when she saw this problem. She said, you just take your pencil, you put it right here, and then you go up, and then you go over and make another dot. Then you connect the dots, and then the best part, of course, put the arrows on the end. Well, um, at the time, not only was my student excited, I was excited too. Hey, she remembered the skill from last year. But then along came um, standardized testing. Shortly thereafter, Pennsylvania released uh, a test that really pushed to make sure kids understood the underlying math. Now you could pause and read through this, but you could see that it's actually quite an easy question. This, this is not a difficult concept if you understand the underlying mathematics. However, if as my student that I just reviewed with, um, the primary way you understand math is simply the processes that you memorized. This, my kids were, were hopeless at this. So what is algebra? Is it a bunch of steps? Is it underlying ideas? Is it tools? Take a moment to think about your own definition. And now think about what other people tend to say. If we were live, of course, I'd be asking you these things you'd be answering. Well, I'm going to answer what is algebra from my perspective to get into this session. I think of algebra as a journey, a powerful journey, and it starts in concrete mathematics. So you might think of there's this like a great divide. And on one side, it's where kids arrive. They understand already money and bricks and hamburgers and um, this is concrete math, it's stuff. And where I wanna take the students is to abstractions for problem solving. Things like the slope formula or y equals mx plus b or systems of inequalities. And in between concrete math and abstractions for problem solving, we need discovery. Students figuring these things out. Now. A common danger, danger number one, is that instead of having kids figure them out, people start with the formulas, the tools, and say, here's student, here's a process, here's a tool, and here's how to use it. Now, what that does is it alienates the students. They never actually get to figure the patterns out, the rules out for themselves, and they don't understand the underlying meaning. So my first prescription, is to make sure students have opportunities to build those tools as they understand patterns, starting with concrete questions, AKA word problems. Uh, danger number two, as you approach algebra, is using strange numbers, big numbers, you know, negative mixed numbers, et cetera. Kids get to the beginning of algebra and we say, well, before you can start algebra, let's make sure you understand decimals, fractions, mixed numbers, integers, and you can spend weeks or even months now with COVID trying to make sure they learned all the skills ahead of time uh, from the precursor skills. And they get to the point where by the time you are trying to teach some algebra, they've already decided algebra is just more of the same, more complex numbers and difficulties. I believe any algebra concept can be conceptually and procedurally um, arrived at without obfuscating with massive or special or different numbers. So my second prescription is to use simple numbers. And then finally, I think I just note that um, discovery is the highlighted like main chunk, right? There is a real difficulty with discovery. If you've done discovery, um, a little, what used to be a little lesson, let me show some examples, kids will do it after I do it can become a day or two days or three days. And at the end, you can wonder, what did we really achieve? Do my kids actually have something they're gonna carry forward? So I wanna advocate something that I call lightweight discovery or just discovery light. These three prescriptions are going to be for me 
the guiding principles as we talk about taking kids on this powerful journey from concrete to abstractions. Now I do have a, that's the introduction of a schedule. There's five parts beyond this um, introduction. First, I'm gonna give you two lessons. So this will be difficult because it's a video and I want to do it in person. There's sort of an interactive component. Um, I'm gonna actually in a very fast and abbreviated um, fashion deliver these two lessons that form then the underpinnings for three more lessons. The third, fourth, and fifth lessons are the ones where I'm actually gonna give you three, again, rather abbreviated lessons that I give to students. I should tell you that ahead of time that I'm gonna be asking questions and then going on as if the class had answered them. There's a whole time for dialogue that won't happen because, well, this is a video. You can pause anytime you want. So how do I get this whole algebra party started? Well, the first day, the first minute, I have this slide on the screen. Kids are sitting down. I say, hey, let's go. Today's essential question is, what is the main topic of algebra? I want to give them a framework that's concrete, that's simple numbers, um, and that's lightweight. Well, I, these are the slides. So good morning. Today's essential question is, what is algebra? Oh, what's this? Well, it's bears holding hands and cute little animals and some halo characters. Ah, algebra is all about this? Yes, algebra is all about relationships. Now, of course, when we say relationships, we think about people, but numbers can have relationships too. Algebra is about relationships between numbers. I'll give you an example so we can give you a sense of what that could mean. Suppose a pizza delivery person is working by the hour and getting paid. Well, that's a relationship, a relationship between hours and dollars. More hours is going to make more dollars. That's the whole idea, right? So, of course, if you work zero hours, you don't get paid anything. How much do you get paid if you, if you work one hour? Well, that's right. I didn't tell you. I'm going to say for this job, it's $8 an hour. So how much will you get paid if you work three hours? Good. How much will you get paid if you work eight hours? Nice. This is our first relationship. As the hours are increasing, the dollars are increasing. That's what you'd want. Let's do another relationship. Uh, this is relationship between the miles that you drive and the number of gallons of gas that are still in your car. So how many gallons of gas are there at the beginning before you drive at all? No miles, car is full tank. Well, you're right, I didn't tell you. Let's say it's 12 gallons. And I'll tell you further, if, if you drive 20 miles in this car, you then have 11 gallons. So let me ask you a question. How many gallons would be left after 40 miles? How many gallons would be left after 100 miles? Nice, good work. So what's different about this relationship? Right, now as the miles increase, the gallons decrease. So another relationship, our second relationship between numbers. Let's take this into a weird little corner. What are relationships made of? Well, conversation, time together, notes, gifts, inside jokes. Right, that's what human relationships could be made of. What are relationships between numbers made of? So I want numerical relationships. Well, here's a hint. Here's the first relationship we looked at. Zero hours, zero dollars, one hour, eight dollars, three dollars, 24 hours. Sometimes we write that with, instead of with arrows, we write with parentheses and a comma, but this, what's on the screen is the same thing. And this is what relationships between numbers are made of. One number that's changing, causing another number that's changing. These are the building blocks. As a hint, the answer to our question is relationships are made of p of n. Can you fill that in? Right, pairs of numbers, good. Okay, so that was the first Fundamental building block, very abbreviated. That's my first day. It takes longer when I'm with kids. Um, another lesson I need to kind of briefly go through as I I'm trying to show you how to usher kids from concrete. And you could see how that was very concrete, right? Simple numbers, not much in the way of discovery yet. We'll see that later. But another 
fundamental piece that I give kids is this. What are the three ways to show a relationship? This is the third or fourth day of my scope and sequence. So I, I walk kids through, I remind them as pairs of numbers. Relationships have three ways to show those pairs of numbers. You can put them in a table, you can make a rule out of them, or you could make a graph. Let's drill down into that. So we've been saying relationships are made of pairs of numbers. Remember, we did that the other day. Um, a table, of course, look, no, that's a, once again, a dumb math joke. It's, that's not what I mean when I say a table. When we talk about a table, let's go back to our $8 uh, an hour example. It's a way of taking the answers to all those questions we answered. Uh, after five hours, there's $40. After 12 hours, there's $96. And putting them in a visual tool called a table, where the first column represents say hours, it's what's driving the situation. And the second column represents the resulting numbers, dollars in this case. So it's a relationship between hours and dollars. The table gives you a place to show some pairs of numbers in the relationship. Now, in math, us math people, we don't like to write hours, we don't like to write dollars. Often we abbreviate, you might think, well, why not H and D, which would be perfectly acceptable, but often in math, the first column the numbers that are kind of driving the situation, we call that the X variable. And the second column, the, the result of changing the first number, we call that Y. In this case, that's representing then dollars. Let's go to the rule. What's a rule? Now, this a, sounds strange. A rule is like, be, be in your seat when the bell rings. That's a rule, right? Well, this is a little different. Um, the rule, again, going back to what we know uh, in our relationship we're using as an example, after two hours is $16, five hours is $40. The rule is telling you what you're doing to the hours to get the dollars. This is the rule. This governs our relationship. What did you do to the hours mathematically to get the dollars? That's right. You multiply by eight. Now, what we do in algebra is we often, wait, is there something wrong with my slides? That's the same question. Yeah, I'm gonna actually change um, the screen a bit to remind you that when we say hours, we often use something abbreviated, something small, a variable X, and dollars in this case, I'm gonna call Y. So I have the same question, but now I'm saying, if I give you the X value, the two, the five, what math do you do to, the, um, to it to get the y value? In other words, um, right, you multiply x by eight. So you want y? You want to know what y is? What dollars are? Multiply the x value, the hours, by eight. So the rule is that the dollars are going to be equal to eight times whatever the hours are. All right. What about a graph? The third way to show a bunch of pairs of numbers. Um, well, the graph is like a picture of a bunch of pairs of numbers. In other words, I'm going to say this once or twice. I want to see every pair of numbers in the relationship. So let's make a graph. Remember, we studied quarter plane yesterday and the day before. You all have that top of mind. I want to show the four pairs of numbers. Well, actually, like I said, I want to show all the pairs of numbers in this relationship. Well, first, remember that. Um, X is safe for hours, Y is safe for dollars. I'm going to label that. But there's some points here that might be kind of easy, like zero, zero. But then it gets a little complicated. I have to go to 216. I need some marks here. And my strategy is typically to go to the biggest number I need. So the biggest Y would be 96. Wow, I don't want to make 96 little marks. So I have to make some kind of choice. I think I'll go by 20s. Remember our review from yesterday. And then, um, to get to 12, uh, you know, you could make 12 marks. I, I decided to count by threes. So if I'm going to go to 216, it's almost one mark to the right. And like, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm, I, I'm going to start by doing my sort of biggest number, which is four marks over and near the top. All right, after 12 hours, $96. Now, this is what I was saying. The point that's two hours and $16, five hours and $40. There we have it, four pairs of numbers in this relationship. What's missing? That's right, I said I wanna see all the pairs of numbers. Give me another one. 
Yeah, exactly. There's like all kinds. What, what if you work one hour and you just get $8? Or what if you work exactly three hours and work 24 hours? There's so many possibilities, lots and lots of pairs of numbers. Now, when we draw a graph in algebra, we want to see all the pairs of numbers, but you might say we're lazy. I don't think it's true, but we don't want to make a bunch of dots. So what we do is we just make a line, or in this case, a ray that represents all the pairs of numbers in a relationship. But when you see a ray or a line, I want you to think that's made up of a bunch of pairs of numbers. And that there we have the third way to show a relationship. All right. So uh, again, this is, it feels weird recording this. There's so much more dynamic dialogue when I do it in person, but hopefully you get from those two pieces a sense of keeping it really simple, simple numbers, keeping it concrete as much as possible. We haven't really built up too much abstraction. It's just that one rule, right? Y equals eight X. But other than that, it's all been sort of almost tactile. And, and um, now we can advance to really the heart of this session, which is to go through three lessons that apply these principles to skills and concepts that all of us teach. Let's start with the essential question, how are the table and rule connected? Well, good morning. Let's do how are the table and rule connected? All right, read this question. No, it's not a question, it's a situation. Let's make it into some questions. My first question for you, how many bricks are in the wall at the beginning? Right. How many bricks are in the wall after one hour, two hours? I want to I want to see all three of your answers for one through three in a table. Well, let's go through your answers. Good. And how'd you make the table? Right. Good. Okay. I'm accelerating when they're just that's dialogue, right? So, question number five. I actually want you to write my question. Look carefully at my PowerPoint. What do you think I'm about to ask you? Yep. You notice, by the way, in this presentation, all the answers are right. The kids are always getting them right. <laughs> of course, that's not how it really goes. But anyway, that is, you're right. That's my question. Okay, here's my question. How many bricks are in the wall after 10 hours? You know what? I also want to know how you figured it out. Let me give you a moment. Talk it through with your desk partner. Okay. Now that you've done the work, you know what? I, I, I've started to feel guilty. We're on question five, and so far you've answered everything. You answered one, two, three, four. I'm going to answer question number five because, you know, I've got to do some of the lifting around here. So I'm ready. I remember that at the beginning there were 40 bricks. And I know there's going to be 15 more bricks every hour, and I'm going to figure it out by adding 15 for the first hour. So one hour passes, there were 40 bricks. Yeah, just sit back and watch. I'm going to do all the heavy lifting. I'm at 55 bricks now. We knew that. Look at our little table we made before. And after two hours, well, it's going to be 15 more bricks, right? After three hours, it's going to be 15 more bricks, right? Let me just keep adding here. Ah, da -da -da. thankfully I put this all in the slides earlier so I can just kind of click, but ah, I got there. 190 bricks. I can now answer question number five and none of you had to do any of the work. You're welcome. However, let's go to number six. What do you think the next question will be? You're right. I still want to know the same kind of thing. Hours are changing. What's happening to the bricks? In this case, 50 hours have passed. How many bricks are there now? Let me do this one for you. All right, so huh, you know what? Adding 15 that many times is gonna take me way too long. Let's go back to number five. You know, I, I showed you my way. Just add 15, add 15, add 15. And that's perfectly respectable, but what did some of you do? Like, you have a shortcut. Oh, yeah, let me try that. So another way of answering that question is to start just by figuring out like, 
how many, uh, by the way, again, this is hard to model without you in the room with me. Um, but we have this dialogue and it's, yes, I wanna know 10 hours passed and each of those hours we added 15. It's kind of like, how much do we add all together to the 40? Yeah, 10 15s is 15 times 10 or 150 bricks got added. Of course, we start with 40, right? Good, yes, I agree. So if we're gonna add 150 and we start with 40, exactly. So why not just multiply? and then add, way easier, I'd say. So you have um, two steps there. Can you write all the math that you would do in one expression? Yes, multiply 15 by 10, then add 40. This is like a little instruction. But what we do in algebra, to, uh, well, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. So let's do that here. Go ahead and do it. Now tell me what you did. Yeah. So you should have ended up with 15 times 50 plus 40. But let me widen this a little bit. Look at the table now. Don't tell me the quote answer. Don't tell me what goes in the empty box down in the bottom right corner. Answer the three questions that are on the screen. I'll give you a little time. Okay, time's up. So what math will you do to fill in the table? Right, good. That's exactly it. We've done this a bunch. In other words, I didn't ask you to actually do the math. I said, what are you gonna do? I wanna see if you understand the pattern. You're building a tool. Um, all right. What about number eight? Let's generalize. Just what do you do to the hours mathematically to get the bricks? Right, you multiply by 15, then you add 40. And if I said after 10,000 hours, you could multiply 10,000 by 15, just keep doing it. And then finally, you would just add 40 each time. All right, this next question, number nine, is the, is the algebra moment. It's where we take all these numbers we've been playing with and set most of them aside and use X and Y instead. Remember we say, if, if there's something that's sort of driving the relationship, we call that X. You could call it H. I wouldn't die over that. But a lot of teachers use X and Y, so I'm going to as well. The question here is, what math do you do to the X to get the Y, the bricks? You got it. Right. That, my friend, is one of the ways of showing a relationship. We have two ways on the screen right now, don't we? There's the table over there on the right. And what do we call this again? Yeah, we call that the rule. You just wrote a rule for a relationship. You said, you want to know what bricks is? Multiply hours by 15 and add 40. Let's do a few more of these. And actually, uh, people watching this video, I have to move some stuff on my screen so I can see my own. All right. So let's do a few um, sort of further examples. Why don't you read this and answer all of the questions? I'll give you a minute. Nice. OK, let's, time's up. Let's go over this. What did you um, put in the Y column? OK, um, that makes sense to me. Good logic. If we're going to say that it's hours and friends, then at the beginning, there's 90. And after an hour passes, well, you know, you add nine. Oh, I'm back to my adding now. Like this is Josh style. But it's so simple, right? Uh, uh, exactly. Yes, I agree with you. Add nine again, right? Yay. True, true confessions. Did anybody add nine again? Yeah. Uh, what, look carefully, what do you have to think about now? Yeah, that eight is kind of like a, a little curveball, right? It's kind of like those bigger numbers earlier, the, the 50, the 800. What are you going to do to the eight to fill in the box? Don't just tell me what goes in the box. What are you going to do to it? Add nine? No? Okay, that's like, yeah. So I forgot I had those slides. It, it, we're going to take out 
the, the thinking we were doing. Don't think about it in terms of plus minus. What's the pattern we discovered in our brick discussion? Nine friends every hour for eight hours. Well, first of all, you're gonna start with 90 and you're gonna add nine times eight. Yeah, I agree. Yes, that's right. That's what I would do too. So there's two ways to write an equation for this. Did you, did you, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I put the 162 in there. I agree. What did you write? Yes, you could write it that way because we're doing it over and over again. We're taking the starting amount and adding nine times hours, nine times eight hours, nine times two hours. We could also, like a lot of algebra people, this is how we like to write it, put the nine X before the 90. That's typical like we saw in our BRICS example. Let's do one more. All right, so I'll give you some time to work on this. Oh, time's up. <laughs> I hope you were careful here. Let's see what happens. What we're talking about is stuff, right? Hours and kents, whatever kents are. Apparently something you can explode. So as the hours pass, the kents are getting exploded. Careful here. I agree, yes, you're right. What, what's the situation after one hour? Ah, you didn't get caught. Good for you. Exploding is not going to be giving you more. If you're exploding these things, you're subtracting, you're losing them. So take six away after an hour and take six away after two hours. How about after 20 hours? Well, you could do the old Mr. Britton way that I showed you back when we were doing the discussion. Subtract six, 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 up, oh, I'm losing count. But that doesn't sound any fun. How much do you have to subtract altogether? Don't tell me the final box here. I don't want to know the final answer. Just if you start with 210 and 20 hours have passed, how many kents have been exploded? Yeah, good. So here's the math that I finally did. I took the 210 that I started with and I took away a whole bunch of kents. They were all blown up six times 20 or 120. Right, so in the end, 90 kents would remain. All right, what was your rule? Ooh, yeah, gotta subtract. The pattern here is you could subtract every time in a sense. You could say, you wanna know how, how many after 20 hours? Do 210 minus six times 20. You wanna know how many after 50 hours? Ooh, that gets a little strange actually. I better not ask that question. That's pretty advanced if you wanna talk about that one later. But you can see the pattern and you stated it well. Now, again, I just gotta give you advance notice. Us math people prefer to put the term with the X first. You can cover your eyes and not look at that part right now if you don't want to. Okay, so uh, getting back to our schedule, I am blitzkrieging through lessons. I'm trying to give you a taste of how a lesson can be um, approachable to everyone, algebra for everyone, by using simple numbers, starting with the concrete and building to abstraction. You see how we started with bricks and lots of questions about bricks and gently nudged kids into trying to understand a rule that expresses the relationship. And you can see that it's lightweight. It's discussion oriented. I've got the slides, but um, when I do it with kids, that's a, a 25 minute thing not a two day thing, there's no manipulatives. I like long things and I like manipulatives, but I don't have time to fully dive down into um, heavy duty discovery on all the stuff. So I can only do that a little bit. And this is a way I kind of, kind of balance the need to actually give kids a sense of connection and building, but not use too much class time. Speaking of using time, I still have two more uh, lessons to go. So let me move forward, trying to demonstrate these three principles once again, but now teaching everyone's favorite standard form. I remember when I was a new teacher, oh, I don't have time for stories. I'm going to move on. <laughs> All right. So standard form. Well, what is standard form? It, okay. Okay. Class, today's question is what is standard form? Um, All right. Well, you know what those are. That's not standard form. Those are hot dogs. 
So uh, suppose each hot dog is costing $2. Um, you represent that with the total. Oh, I, you know, I forgot I was going to ask you a question. How would you show that mathematically? Uh, I'm sorry. I started telling a story and you see what happens. My whole brain comes unglued. This is how I do this. I want you to tell me the math you're going to do to get the cost for the hot dogs. Don't tell me how much the hot dogs are gonna cost. Tell me the math you're going to do. Good. All right, similar thought. We got eight hamburgers and they're $3 each. Tell me the math you're going to do to find the cost for hamburgers. Good. All right, so the total cost, when we add all that up, that's what you're paying. And I, I know some of you are thinking, did you say this is about something called standard form? I don't know yet what that is. Okay, we'll get there. All right. So let's take that little intro and turn it into a situation. Mr. Britton bought some hot dogs and hamburgers. Hot dogs cost $2 each. Hamburgers cost $3 each. Oh, and he spent $30. Oh, that's a twist. All right. I've got a question for you. That guy, Mr. Britton, what could he have possibly purchased if he spent $30? Hot dogs cost $2 and hamburgers cost $3. Well, let's make columns. Let's have the first column, the X column, be the hot dogs, the number of hot dogs. And the second column, the hamburgers column, what are you going to say? What are some pairs of numbers? Like, let, let's, let's get one together. I'll actually get you started. Um, oh, what a coincidence. I already did this one for you. Two of the, um, I'm sorry, three of the hot dogs at $2 each and eight of the hamburgers at $3 each would cost $30. So one pair of numbers would be three comma eight, three hot dogs, eight hamburgers. All right, what else can you get? Oh, time's up. What do you got? Good. Yes, I agree with you. Just buy 10 hamburgers. Who wants a hot dog anyway? Or yes, absolutely. Just buy 15 hot dogs. Got anything else? Yep. Good point. Mm -hmm. Six of each. And um, what's your last one? Yeah, there you go. Now I said, what's your last one? Um, I actually skipped one when I made this table. What was the last one? Yeah. So see the pattern there? again and again and again, we're always looking for patterns, aren't we? In general, if I wanted to say what's governing this relationship, what's like the rule if it's $2 for a hot dog, to get to that, I could say, what if I don't tell you the number of hot dogs, but I say they cost $2 each? What math will you do if you use X to represent the number of hot dogs to get the cost of hot dogs? Two hot dollars each, X hot dogs purchased. Yep, good. Okay, you, you get the idea. So if it's $3 per hamburger, but I'm not going to tell you the number of hamburgers, what math will you do for the cost of hamburgers? Excellent. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, you're right. I didn't tell you why. I mean, <laughs> didn't tell you that the letter Y would represent the number of hamburgers. So the total cost would be $2 times the number of hot dogs and, well, we put a plus there, $3 times the number of hamburgers. And there's something missing here, which is the total cost that it's going to come to for that situation, the 30. Ladies and gentlemen, this is our first standard form rule. So in general, standard form rules don't say Y equals, like we're so used to after the last week. They say, something times x, in this case it was two, and something times y, in this case it was three, equals some other number. They're very good, this, this kind of rule is very good for what we could think of as a constraint or a limitation. Mr. Britton could spend exactly $30. What are some pairs of numbers that make that possible? That's called standard form. All right, uh, and of course, we always want to know what the graph looks like. How do you think we're going to graph this? Okay, let me give you a minute. Why don't you sketch out what you think it's going to look like? Okay, time's up. Let's take a look. Well, first of all, 
I labeled my axes to remind myself what we're talking about. And I used fives because I could see I needed to get to a 10 on the y-axis and a 15 on the x-axis. Of all those pairs of numbers, there's two that really stand out for me, really pop. Zero comma 10. And these other numbers, yeah, you know, they kind of wander down, but then 15 comma zero. You can see I skipped one on my table. What are you gonna do now? Well, you're gonna connect the dots, of course, right? So this shows all the pairs of numbers. Now you notice I don't keep going, why can't I say, you know, what, 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 where's the point when you buy, uh, say, uh, 50 hot dogs? That's right. You can't. You don't, you don't have enough money. So as I said earlier, the word limitations kind of gets there for us. We're saying these are the combinations. There aren't any beyond this. Um, as a replay, when I'm graphing in standard form, I usually just use the intercepts they're called. And when I, when I find the intercepts, I can just connect the dots. I know all the other pairs of numbers will fall on the segment between those two dots. So again, the technical word is intercepts. All right. Um, I hope you're not getting too hungry because here's another one. What if, what if we have some tacos and some burritos and uh, it's a purchase situation, I'm buying them and I'm buying 15 items. So like 14 tacos and one burrito, 10 tacos, five burritos. You know what's gonna happen. Yep, for sure, always. The table is your friend. So why don't you fill in some pairs of numbers representing possibilities for this situation? Time's up. So good, yeah, absolutely. You know, in my mind, does I do the same thing. You could have gotten no tacos and 15 burritos or 15 tacos and no burritos. And then there's all kinds of combinations other than that. You're right, yeah. So again, like with my prior table, I'm not gonna show every pair of numbers. But you go ahead and answer these questions. Time's up. So they all add, right? They all add to 15. So, so wait, how am I gonna write that as a rule that the X value and the Y value, the number of tacos, the number of burritos has to add up to 15 every time? Hey, you came up with it. Wonderful. This is another standard form equation. So remember we said it's AX plus BY equals C, something times X plus something times Y. Wait, I don't see anything times X. I don't see anything times Y. What's there? What's the, the coefficient, if you will, if we wanted to write it in? Yes, see, it's just a one. But this is standard form as well. It doesn't say Y equals like we're accustomed to. It's something X plus something Y equals 15. In this case, it's something, we don't even write it. How are you gonna graph that? Go ahead, time's up. Yes, uh, you're gonna label. And once again, now we kind of have a shortcut in mind, don't we? We're like, there's a lot of pairs of numbers, but if you just choose the intercepts, I, I did it the long way. If you just do the intercepts and connect them, you'll be done. All the other pairs of numbers will fall in line, as it were. They don't, don't. Okay. So let's, have, let's do a little practice. Why don't you go ahead and work this one out? Um, I'll like throw a question up and you give it a shot. Okay, time's up. Oh, I've got more questions. Oh, I'm sorry. So time out to the audience that I'm talking to. Um, we, we talk all these through, talk it through, talk it through, talk it through, talk it through. And then finally, uh, we talk through the graph. I'm gonna, I forgot, I was just gonna go like light speed through these. All right, because I only have a little more time left and I have now finally the mystery topic. Now I've deliberately led us to this moment. Uh, do you remember the example at the beginning where I said this girl went through this process, she was proud, happy, I was proud and happy, but ultimately the sad thing was she didn't understand anything. 
as soon as um, I was held accountable to more significant, more meaningful questions that were actually simple numbers, basic concepts, but they weren't process driven, everything fell apart. Well, the mystery topic is going to get us finally to um, a sweet resolution to that very specific issue. So the mystery topic. Uh, good morning. I, actually, when I teach it, this is how I teach it too. I don't tell this topic. Today's essential question is, what is a... Well, we'll fill in the blank later. So well, I'm sorry. Once again, let's go through this lesson and look for ways to use simple numbers, keep it concrete, almost tactile for the kids as we try to build these abstractions. Um, all right. So I'm not gonna tell you the topic, but I will give you a situation. Um, suppose you go into the store and uh, you're gonna buy some sun chips, $5 or $2 each, some subs at $5 each, and you have $15 to spend, all right? But I'm not gonna tell you buy this many sun chips, buy this many subs. I'm just gonna tell you what could you buy? What's possible here? You've got $15, you could buy chips, you can buy subs. You know what I'm gonna ask for? Yep, there it is. Give me a table of the possibilities. All right, let's go over it. what you got? Um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. So th this particular, uh, I, I'm actually gonna take a time out and walk through this. In this particular lesson, I have partners working together on dry erase boards and I'm walking quietly around the room. Most of the kids in my ninth grade kind of um, more challenged math classes at, on this lesson um, will finish within seconds because we've been doing tables a lot. We've been thinking of pairs of numbers a lot. It's very practical for them. They go bam, bam. And then they sit there and look smug. They're just waiting. And I just keep walking around quietly because almost always I have at least one pair that says, Mr. Ben, Mr. Ben, do we have to spend all the money? And I'm waiting for that. And I say, I, I, I don't think so. I didn't say that. And so they keep working. And most part, partnerships are done. They're waiting. They're waiting for me. Why am I taking so long? So when I finally uh, go over it with them, it's kind of fun. By now, everybody assumes that 15 is the max constraint. So uh, I, I forgot to say, I, I, I even, to, to kind of almost mislead them, I put the first zero down. Um, so that if you don't buy any chips, how many subs could you buy? And they go three, right? Because they're like, I have to spend 15. They're used to standard form. They're used to making tables. So uh, they just, we discuss the results. It's kind of funny. It turns out there's a whole bunch. In fact, sometimes when I'm walking around, just so that everybody really digs in, I let one or two groups get all the way to like finding all the pairs of numbers. And then I say, you know what? Some of you only have a couple of pairs of numbers. There's 18. And then they're like, wait, what, really? All right, so then we go over this. And then I, uh, when I show this screen, I say, there's two here that aren't in the relationship. Why not? Good, this one and this one. And we discuss why. All right, so this relationship is very strange. Uh, by the way, I'm just getting a notification that my battery is dying. So I'm gonna relocate as I continue. Very smooth, right? Um, I don't want to, I don't know how to do video foo. All right, now we're plugged in. So th this takes us to a new kind of role. What has to be true about every pair of numbers in this relationship? What's the rule? Well, yeah, we know how to express how much money it's gonna cost. It's gonna be $2 per bag times the bags, $5 per sub times the subs. But we don't have to spend the 15. We can spend nothing. We could spend $5. We're not having to use exactly $15. So the rule is very familiar to us, except for there's gonna be some kind of twist. We're used to putting in equals there saying that the amount of money spent is equal to $15. How do you, what do you put there that says it, it could be 15, but it could be, I don't wanna say the words because it gives it away. Yeah, there's another symbol we have in math. Remember, less than or equal to. 
the amount of money we're spending could be lower than 15 or that bar, that, remind, that, that means it could be equal to 15. You could spend exactly $15, but you can't spend more. So um, now we get back to the essential question. It's what is a linear inequality? That less than, that's an inequality symbol. And we were accustomed to having equals, and now we're sometimes going to use an inequality, perhaps a less than or equal to, maybe a greater than or equal to. Hey, just uh, you might want to write this down, those of you who don't remember. Um, these are the symbols. You can write them down, you can reference that because there are two that we'll be using. And depending on the situation you're talking about, you might say, like when we're doing money, the amount of money has to be below 15 or equal to 15. Or you might, you might have to, you might have a situation where you're saying the amount of money has to be equal to or above some specific amount. So that'd be greater than or equal to. Well, let's practice this a little bit. Why don't you go ahead and practice this, think about it, and we'll talk. Oh, time's up. All right. What about this one? Okay, time's up. What about this one? Time is up again. Uh, by the way, I'm like I said, I'm, I'm abbreviating. We would discuss. Um, try this. Time is up yet again. Okay. Now the moment we've all been waiting for. What about the graph? It's a graph again. Right. It's a, it shows you every pair of numbers in the relationship. Now, graph it. I want you to show me every pair of numbers in the relationship. Okay, time out. When I'm teaching this, I actually, that's, this is all I do. They have dry erase boards and I walk around and behold what is for me as in late game and teaching, a thing of beauty. My kids graph their first linear inequality without ever being told how to. They understand this relationship and um, they think, okay, I need to show a pair of numbers at zero, zero. I need to show a pair of numbers at zero, one. They do what I'm about to show you. They actually, I walk around, I see them making dots. Now, if that doesn't sound wonderful to you, maybe you haven't taught inequalities before, but I'm telling you, it's so much better than just saying, here's a test point, plug it into this thing. And then if you get a true statement, shade that side, this is the absolute opposite of that. The kids totally understand because of the sequence of lessons that I'm showing you, um, going from concrete to abstract, that a graph is made of pairs of numbers and the pairs of numbers are meaningful. So they, they actually graph the, everything I'm showing here now, top speed, they think this through and they laboriously make the graph and they connect the dots. Um, so in the end, I do talk about uh, like the pairs of numbers tend to be in a zone and we often shade it to show all the pairs of numbers instead of having to make every single dot. And we, um, we can get away with sort of just finding the boundary and just shading one side of it. But at this stage, I don't talk about that that, that heavily. All right, so then we practice um, and I'm, I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna click, 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 click. So notice that the first example, now we use a greater than or equal to. Um, okay, this comes, this brings us to near the end. Remember how this just blew me away? My kids on the Pennsylvania state standardized testing, they would see a question like this and have absolutely no trouble. That shaded region for my kids wasn't some mystery zone, some rule thing, something they did by like doing thousands of steps. It was just, there are the pairs of numbers that express the possibilities. So they could easily understand this question. Um, of course, this session isn't about this question, but what I'm trying to drive towards is um, if you want kids to have a powerful journey and not just kind of force fed a bunch of process, the key elements are giving them ways to build from simple numbers, concrete situations that can then 
build into patterns um, using really a very lightweight discovery, questions that get them thinking about things they can actually do the math in their heads. Well, this has been algebra for everyone. I, I, I confess to have been challenged to make a video out of it because I'm so accustomed to using this in person. I hope it's some benefit to you uh, and not too like um, high speed, I think. Um, you know, there's my contact information on the screen there. If you're actually watching this and got to this point and there's some benefit to you, drop me a note. Say, hey, I saw your session. That was cool. Thank you or something. So that I know that uh, it was not for naught, as it were. All the best. Thanks so much for watching. Take care.